All right, we're going to talk now about momentum and impulse. Uh, now, momentum is, if you will, a parallel to inertia. It, it, it isn't a measure of inertia, but it is very, very similar. It's the tendency of an object that's in motion to want to stay in motion there. And the mathematical way to define momentum, P equals mass times velocity. Momentum represented by a lowercase p equals m times v. Make sure that's a lowercase p there. Um, now, momentum is a very easy calculation to do. If you have a car, let's say, that um, has a mass of 500 kilograms, so uh, p equals a mass of 500 kilograms going 10 meters per second, just to make my math very, very easy, then I'm going to have a momentum here of uh, 5,000 and now unit for momentum. Unit for momentum and for impulse over here is kilogram meters per second. Also the Newton second. Uh, whichever way you want to talk about that is perfectly fine. Uh, lots of times I use kilogram meters. That's in the numerator. Kilogram meters divided by seconds. That's, that's the unit I use majority of the time. Newton seconds is the same unit there. Um, it, it's just manipulated around a little bit mathematically, not a big deal. So calculations for momentum, very plug chug, very just P equals MV. So if it just asks, what is the momentum of this object? Just straightforward, no collisions, no time, no anything else. All you have to do is plug chug through P equals MV. Very, very simple. Now, impulse is also very simple, but uh, is a lot more interesting. Just calculating the momentum of something if there isn't a collision isn't very useful. But impulse uses momentum uh, in a way that can be very neat. Now, impulse is the change in an object's uh, momentum due to a net force being applied to it. I mean, if you think about it, you apply a force to an object. Maybe it's the car's engine applying a force uh, to the car making the wheels turn, it's going to cause a change in momentum. Specifically, it's going to cause the car to speed up. So momentum, or excuse me, impulse equals force times time. Impulse also equals change in momentum. Now, these two equations really aren't useful, but uh, because this idea of impulse really isn't useful, but whenever you set these two sides equal to each other, you get our impulse equation. That's the one we want. Change in momentum equals force times time. Uh, lots of times you'll see this broken down again. reason why you can break it down again is because odds are you're not changing the mass. So mass ch times change in velocity, delta V, equals force times time. Um, you could break that down if that's, if that's confusing to you. That change in velocity is final velocity minus initial velocity equals force times time. Remember, change in delta final minus initial there. But th that's the equation we're going to want to use right here. This also does have a uh, specific purpose whenever it comes to graphical, uh, whenever it comes to analyzing something graph-wise. Force times time equals change in momentum. What that means here is that the area under a force time graph is the change in momentum. So, for example, this, this area right here this area right here is going to be my change in momentum, delta P. So if I asked for the change in momentum of this object shown in this force time graph from uh, 0 to 10 seconds, well, the area under this, this is obviously a rectangle here from 0, starting over here, to 10 seconds over there. Divide up the area under the graph just like we did with motion graphs, right? Divide up the area and I see that it's just simply a rectangle. Area of a rectangle is base times height, so my change in momentum is my base, 10, times my height, 3, or my change in momentum is 30 kilogram meters per second. Let's make the second graph and problem a little bit more interesting. I'm going to give a mass of 10 kilograms, an initial velocity of zero, and then ask, hey, using this graph, starting from zero seconds to six seconds over the course of, oop, I put newtons there, that should say seconds there, because x-axis, seconds, force on the y, time on the x, and a force time graph area under change in momentum. Find for me the final velocity. So I'm applying a force like this between zero and six seconds. It goes up to five newtons in a linear manner over two seconds and then flat lines. I'm applying a constant five newtons of force uh, for the next four seconds from two to six. What is the final velocity? Well, remember that uh, area under a force time graph is my change in momentum, and I have two different shapes whenever I divide this up. I've got a triangle here and a rectangle there. And so if I get those two areas, that will give me the change in momentum right? Change in momentum. So here a triangle, one-half base times height, and a rectangle, base times height. 
So I got the area under the graph, the two different pieces, and I add them together, right? The piece of the triangle, the piece of the rectangle. Remember, area under a force time graph is going to be my change in momentum. It kind of comes from this impulse idea up here. Um, so I add the two pieces together, or however many pieces you might have in a different graph. Get the area under, make them into nice geometric shapes, triangles and rectangles pretty much. Um, add all the areas together. I come out with 25 kilogram meters per second, but that's not the final answer in this problem. I'm not just looking for the change in momentum. I'm looking for the final velocity. Well, now I can actually use what momentum is. So I'm going to pull from this idea right here. Change in momentum is mass times change in velocity. That's the exact same idea as the original momentum equation, right? Momentum is mass times velocity, and so change in momentum must be mass times change in velocity. If I put a delta out in front here, I'd have to put a delta in front of the velocity, assuming that the mass remains exactly the same. So momentum equals mass times change in velocity. Now I can just plug in some numbers. So I have the change of velocity from the graph, 25 kilogram meters per second. Remember, area under a force time graph is my change of momentum times the mass, 10. Uh, uh, let's see, equals the mass, 10, times final velocity minus initial velocity, 0. And I come out with a final velocity of 2.5 meters per second. All right, so let me solve a couple of problems for you. First, let's deal with a car engine. And the car engine can provide a maximum force of 3,250 newtons. Try to accelerate my uh, just over 700 kilogram car. And I want to know what's the, be the car's best 0 to 60, uh, 0 to 60 miles per hour kind of, kind of car lingo. That means the car is going from an initial 0 velocity all, all the way up to 60 miles per hour is 26.8 meters per second. So how fast can it go? In other words, we're going to push the engine as hard as it can. We're going to use every ounce of force to keep our time as, as low as possible. Now let me take, take kind of a step aside and talk about this idea of change in momentum just to make sure we don't mathematically get confused here. Anytime you have change in something, it's the final, so final momentum minus initial momentum. What you ended up at minus what you started out at. That, that's, that's the change in or this delta sign. Here. Um, so if I continue to work that, change in momentum is, momentum is mass times velocity, so mass times final velocity, right? Final here, final there, um, minus your mass times your initial velocity. The mass of the object, since it's only one object, it's not a collision, only one object, the mass of the object isn't changing, right? So I can, I can factor the mass out. What's changing is the velocity, it's speeding up or slowing down, so I can have final minus initial, and final minus initial velocity is the same as delta V. So you're going to see us change uh, delta P, or change momentum, into M delta V all the time. Just know delta V, you take the final velocity minus the initial. Just wanted to make sure we didn't get confused on that. So this, it doesn't tell me anything about time in this problem. So this lends itself, or excuse me, it, it's asking for time. It doesn't tell me anything about displacement in this problem. So this lends itself perfectly to impulse. Now, I could solve this using Newton's second law, F equals ma. I know an F. I know an M. That'll let me get an A, right? Then I know uh, a final velocity and an initial velocity. That'll let me get a time. That's a multi-stepper. Or I could just go ahead and plug straight into impulse. Impulse is delta P equals FT, right? So that's M delta V equals FT, and now I know everything. I, I can just actually substitute in and solve out no multiple steps. Final velocity, 26.8 minus my initial, 0, equals the maximum force that I'm using, 3,250 times how long I have to exert that force to get up to my 26.8 meters per second. And whenever I substitute in and solve all the way down, I get a, a 0 to 60 time of 6.04 meters per second. Three significant figures, notice three here, three here, three here, and I'm not using the 60 anywhere in there with only one sig fig, so three sig figs everywhere. This is actually a pretty fast car. And let me talk about really fast how to recognize these impulse problems. If you see a problem where we're talking about applying some force, you know, whether, you know, like here, a place kicker's foot, you know, kicking a football, it's applying a force to it. Um, so you see something about a force being applied for an amount of time, here's 87 milliseconds, right? Uh, and then you're not seeing anything about acceleration, but you are seeing things about velocities, right? So if you see force times and velocities, you, you're looking for the force, you know a time, and you know two velocities, final and initial. 
or, or you know um, your final initial velocities and your force and you need to know time. Those things scream use impulse, use impulse. You can go back to Newton's second law in kinematics. It's just not as sleek. It's going to take you an extra step or two, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Another thing that I want to mention is you can have a negative change in momentum, right? If, if the force here is being applied to, let's say, stop you, decelerate you, as opposed to accelerate you, so you would end up with a negative force over here, you can have a negative change in momentum where your final velocity, let's say you're trying to come to a stop, your final velocity is zero and your initial velocity was some, some high number. In this problem though, we are trying to accelerate a football. Place kicker's foot, kicks a football, um, and is in contact with this 41 kilogram football for 87 milliseconds. I'm gonna start using now, uh, whenever I see milli, I'm slapping on a times 10 to the negative three, and I'm just gonna let the calculator work it out from there. I don't have to spend any extra uh, mental energy. Milli means times 10 to the negative three. Accelerates the ball up to 23 meters per second in an attempt to make a 45 yard field goal. That is extraneous. We don't even need to know about that. What is the average force that his, for, that his foot exerts on the ball? So once again, I'm looking for force. I know a time. I know a change in velocity. This screams, let's use impulse here. So momentum is M delta V FT here, right? And so now I just need to substitute in what I have. I, I know the mass is 0.41. Uh, my change in velocity, I'm going from a, I'm going up to a final, so 23 minus my initial. The football was initially at rest, you know, sitting there on the tee if you're familiar with football. Uh, equals F, what I'm looking for, the average force, because technically the force is going to change as the kicker's foot continues to go into the ball and then the ball begins to bounce off of his foot. Um, but uh, the average force that we're looking for here, F times T, and I'm going to use scientific notation so I don't have, even have to worry about jumping the decimal, 87 times 10 to the negative third. Now, now once again, this is, and I, remember I taught you this at the beginning of the year, this is technically not correct scientific notation, but your calculator does not care. Whenever you uh, change milli, prefix milli, means times 10 to the negative three. You just put it on and it's going to work out. Now it's just algebra to plug into a calculator. And so my average force comes out to be, well, using significant figures, 110 newtons is, is how much force he was actually exerting on the ball there on average. And then I just want to go ahead and put in solving this around just using variables to where you get F by itself first. Then you can plug all of that into the calculator at the exact same time. That way you don't have any rounding mistakes. So better if you can work that way.